You're listening to More Than a Song, episode 464. Hello and welcome to this episode of More Than a Song. My name is Michelle Nizat, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you discover the truth of Scripture, hidden in today's popular Christian music. My goal is to teach you to connect portions of God's Word with the songs you're singing along with on the radio, to help you meditate on truths that will transform your way of thinking and ultimately your life. As we get started today, I recognize engaging God's Word for yourself can feel daunting. And while our featured song will give us fresh inspiration as to where to study, the episode guide will give you the inter- interaction tools you need to dig in. So grab your episode 464 guide at michellenizat.com forward slash 464 download. And if you've already subscribed to my email list, this guide is already in your inbox, ready to help you discover and meditate on God's word in new ways. So let's get into it. Now, each week at my home church, I have the privilege of teaching on a panel about the fundamentals of our faith. And one of the sessions that I have the privilege to teach is Christology. And this is the study of the nature and work of Jesus. So when I heard John Reddick's song, I Believe It, The Life of Jesus, I just had to use it on the podcast to inspire our study. I have so much to cover. But before we get to the scripture, let's listen. I believe in the life of Jesus. Now, the goal of our fundamentals class at church is to help participants know what they believe, uh, know why they believe it, and how to actively share their faith with others. And so in my session on Christology, I actually discuss the text of the Nicene Creed. Now, many of you may be familiar with the creeds. Those who attend churches with liturgy may even recite them, and others of you may be of the opinion that creeds are not applicable in your faith setting. But I see this week's song as sort of a creed, and so I want to make the case for creeds at this moment. So historically, the need for creeds came out of false teaching about the deity and humanity of Christ. And in his book, Church History for Modern Ministry, Why Our Past Matters for Everything We Do, Dayton Hartman teaches of the situation in the 4th and 5th centuries. So he says that some heretics argued that Christ was created by the Father. Others divided his divine and human natures into two persons. Others conflated his divine and human natures. And through the convocation of four ecumenical councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, the church affirmed that Jesus is the true God, sharing the same essence with the Father and the Spirit, and that his divine and human natures are distinguishable but inseparable in the unity of his person. That's just a really complicated way of saying he is a member of the Trinity and the Trinity exists. And um, I'm going to go ahead and link to his book in the show notes. It's actually in my Logos software, which I will also link to. That's how I study and utilize, um, and I'm able to bring in some more commentaries and things like that than I have been in, been able to do in the past. But what we had here were teachings that either made Christ more God and less human, or more human and less God, or in some form or fashion, ultimately skewed the teachings of God's word. So this is why the Council of Nicaea put this paragraph about Christ in their creed. It's a, a statement of, of belief that is learned and recited. And the opening phrase is, we believe, and then the section on Christ goes like this. So we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried 
The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. I believe that, don't you? So this is what scripture teaches. And though it was written just a few hundred years after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, it is just as true today as it was then. And each element is based on the teaching of scripture. So what does learning a creed like this do for you? Well, first of all, it combats bad ideas with truth. Next, it can summarize key elements of our faith. It's these simple phrases and statements. Obviously, you could study and know a lot more and in a deeper way, but it, there, it summarizes those key elements. And then finally, it gives you those pegs to hang a deeper understanding on through your study of scripture and your walk with Christ and all of that. And so if you think that we are past all of those bad ideas that plagued the early church so that we no longer need creeds or we no longer need declarations of our faith, I want you to think again. (laughs) Because back in 2016, a LifeWay research poll found that 16% of self-professed evangelicals believed that Jesus was created. Another 11% were unsure whether Jesus is eternal And another 22%, these are Christians, y'all, these are self-proclaimed Christians, uh, 22% believed that God the Father is more God than Jesus. And 96% of those polled, uh, they affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity, but 51% denied that the Holy Spirit is a person. So they'll say, oh yeah, I believe in the Trinity, but they don't understand the Trinity. Uh, And that, that poll was in 2016. And I find in most of the polling data that I study that we are not getting more biblically literate as the years go by. Actually, generally we get less biblically literate as the years go by. And that's why I think that this song can be a really powerful tool for you uh, because we let, we're going to take the chorus and study each element like a creed statement. And then every time you sing the song, then you're going to remember what you studied in scripture. And that's, that's really the pattern that we use on the podcast overall anyway. But um, it, this each line in the chorus is so powerful. So even though we're going to break apart the chorus, I do love the lyrics of the first verse. It says, it's not just a story. It's a living, breathing, walking testimony of a God so good. He'd leave his home in glory for the world he loved, for the world that he so loved. It's not just a story. And it's funny because I often try to avoid the use of the word story on the podcast, especially when I'm talking about scripture. I'm not sure if you notice it, but most of the time I try to say the account rather than the story. I'm not I'm not legalistic about it or anything. Uh, don't blast me if I, if I don't do it every time. But, but I want us to avoid thinking of what scripture teaches as fiction because it's anything but. It's not just a story. Uh, the life of Christ is not fiction either. His life is not just a story to lead us to a saving relationship with a loving father. It is the account of how it all went down. So I agree with John Reddick when he sings, I believe in the life of Jesus. So I'm going to link to an article from gotquestions.org in the show notes, but they had this great explanation in their article entitled, Did Jesus Really Exist? This is actually something that I teach in in, uh, greater depth in my session at church, but Jesus was mentioned in other historical texts corroborating that he was a historical figure. He's not just a character in God's storybook. Uh, Roman Roman writings, Jewish writings, other documents mentioned him by name. They even link him with, obviously Jesus was a common name, but they link him with historical details and figures such as Pontius Pilate to provide this extra biblical proof of his life. However, I don't want you to discount all of the teachings within scripture because the gospels, for example, are written so that people who never met Jesus could know what he said and did during his ministry here on earth. And I'm also thinking of uh, the opening of of first John, first John one verse one says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
Jesus, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So in fact, before we continue on, you know, we studied 1 John in episodes 447, 455, 457. I just, God just kept bringing me back to it. And if you studied 1 John John alongside me during those episodes, then you are going to be delighted as I was to discover that much of what we're declaring in this song, um, elements of that can be found in 1 John in the text as well. And I do love studying larger chunks of scripture. In fact, that's a bite, a Bible interaction tool exercise, which is to study larger chunks of scripture, not just a verse here or there, but big chunks. And while we are taking the bite of studying um, kind of a theme, the life of Jesus based on this song, uh, that's our inspiration, you can actually do both if you study in First John. So there are other examples, um, but these verses remind us that the apostles of Jesus knew him, saw him, touched him, and recorded it all through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so we could believe in the life of Jesus too. And I'm thinking back to what Jesus said to Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So that verse is about you and me. If we believe in the life of Jesus, we are blessed because we didn't see him like the apostles saw him. And yet we have believed. Okay, so let's take the next phrase. I believe that he conquered death. So when John was given God's revelation, he says of when he, he talks about when he first saw Jesus in Revelation chapter one, verse 17, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. And, uh, you know, death claims the body, right? And Hades claims the soul, but not unless Jesus says so. He has the keys. He has the authority. Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades, and he alone opens and closes this door. That's actually how Daniel Aiken puts it in his um, commentary, Exalting Jesus in Revelation. And I will link to that in the show notes as well. So every time you sing that line, remember that conquering death included dying and being raised again and Jesus holding the authority of over death forever. And he in turn promises resurrection and eternal life to us. And a huge part of Jesus's victory over death comes in his resurrection, which is the next line. So our song declares, I believe in the resurrection and How important is it that we believe in the resurrection of Christ? Well, according to Paul, it's pretty important. Consider what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And then again in verse 17, he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then he doubles down when he says in verse 19, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, We are of all people most to be pitied. So keep reading in 1 Corinthians 15. That's another great large chunk to see more of Christ's authority over death and death's future complete destruction. I'll read a few verses. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. So also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So in, in Sean and uh, Josh McDowell's book, More Than a Car- Carpenter, they have a chapter entitled, What Good Is a Dead Messiah? And uh, yes, indeed, you know, but he's not dead. And as our song declares, I believe 
in the resurrection. Don't you? All right. Now, the next line is a perspective that God keeps drawing me back to over and over again. I think that you'll discover it mentioned in First John, should you choose to take the challenge to spend some time there this week. But the phrase is, I believe he's coming back again. And that eternal perspective, it was prevalent in Paul's letters. It, it all started in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. It says, and when he had said these things, this was Jesus talking to his disciples. As they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming back again, (laughs) y'all. You know, and I unpack this um, in quite a bit of detail in episode 368. But listen to what Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 3. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject, subject all things to himself. So we should eagerly await our returning Savior. That's kind of what God has been Laying on my heart, let's keep that eternal perspective in mind, Michelle, and eagerly await him. Titus 2 says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Matthew 24 says, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So he came, he lived, he died, he resurrected, he ascended, and he's coming back again. I believe it. All right, we just have a few more lines to cover. Uh, The next one is, I believe that his spirit's with us. Uh, There are so many places we could go to be reminded of this, but I'm thinking of one in 1 John. 1 John 4, 13 says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Or uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 7 and 8 says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And I, I just can't get over this idea that, yes, his Spirit is with us, but not only is God's Spirit with us, he's in us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And then Galatians chapter 4, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And, and there are so many more, you know, log into a concordance and read all the verses that reference the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, and you will learn so much about him. And it will begin to blow your mind that the very Spirit of God is not only with us, but in us. And it is by that Spirit that we can declare the next phrase, I believe that he gives us power. So it's not just a hope. It's a promise. Let's hop over to Acts and read the red letters of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Right before he ascended into heaven, he said this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And of course he gives us power. His spirit is within us. You know, consider Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in every believer. And the spirit's power gives us strength. Ephesians 3.16 says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And the Spirit's power gives us hope. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I believe that he gives us power. And then finally, I believe that he is the Son of God. You know, basically... 
we're declaring that we believe he is the Messiah when we say that he's the son of God. It's consistent with what he teaches about himself. Uh, but I think Romans chapter one is the best place to go to pull all of this together. Romans one, I'm going to read the first six verses. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. For the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. So in, in just in these far, few verses, we see the life of Christ as a man in the flesh. We see the power of the Holy Spirit. We see the resurrection from the dead. And all of this declares that he is the Son of God. And again, what does that really mean? Well, this title, Son of God, means that he was God made manifest in the flesh. We could actually spend an entire episode on each of these truths that we declare through this song. But I really think that we got off on the right foot. I think you have enough to go exploring on your own. So what's next? Well, I would start by reading a large chunk of scripture. First John's my recommendation, but you could just stay wherever you are studying and then keep your antenna up because you're going to take the chorus of this week's song and see if the large chunk of scripture that you're studying speaks to any of these declarations in the creed style lyrics in, from our song. Uh, you, you might even commit a verse or two to memory, you know, maybe even a verse for each declaration. It's always a good idea to hide God's word in your heart. And then while you're in God's word, let me know how you're doing. You can email me, michelle at michellekneezat.com. Hop on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, I'm sorry, at michellekneezat.com at Michelle Nizat, easy for me to say. My public page on Facebook is Michelle L. Nizat, and we can talk about what you're learning. Now, More Than a Song is a proud member of the NRT Podcast Network. You can check out other podcasts in the network and Christian music resources at newreleasetoday.com. And then don't forget to grab that episode guide at michellekneezat.com forward slash 464 download. And with that in mind, I want to thank my newest subscribers who have subscribed lately, like Victoria from Texas, Jessica from Indiana, Cecilia from California, Eric from Missouri, Chris from Mississippi, Blake from Michigan, Sarah from Australia, Pam from Georgia, Nancy from Georgia, Ardith from Georgia, Robin from Louisiana, and Angela from Louisiana, Victoria from Tennessee, Celine from Alabama, Lindsay from Mississippi, Destiny from South Carolina, Lisanne from Colorado, Veloshni from South Africa, Nancy from Georgia, Patty from Georgia, and Marie from Georgia. Welcome. Now, don't forget, you can listen to the podcast directly on my website at michellekneezat.com. You can listen through iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can follow on Spotify or through Stitcher Radio or your podcast listening app of choice. And if you haven't left a review wherever you listen to podcasts, you can do that today. I would really appreciate it. Or if you don't know how to get there, go head over to lovethepodcast.com forward slash more than a song. Well, that's it for this episode of More Than a Song. Next time, I will be featuring That's the Thing About Praise by Benjamin William Hastings and Blessing Offer to dive into scripture. If you liked this episode, however, would you mind sharing it with others? I've made it really easy. With just one click, you can share via Facebook, Twitter, or email. Just head over to michellekneezat.com forward slash 464. While you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Click on comment to join the conversation. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.